Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I like the responses. That was nice. I, maybe I'll try chanting stuff later and see if you guys join in. But for now, we'll go ahead and get started with EMP. So the link to the slides are there for whatever reason I wrote link this week. Things are getting pretty crazy instead of writing slides. But regardless, they should be taking you to a place that looks like this. And if there are no questions, we'll go ahead and get started. Are you going to go over and stuff? Yeah, um, it's just going to be here. I'll see if I can awkwardly transition. But first, the weekly links for giving feedback. So the feedback form just for EMP here. And then a topic suggestion form, both anonymous, you can find there. Same with song suggestions. So we'll be going over merge sort and quick sort today. And then I have a couple extra things here and there, um, but not a whole, whole lot. So feel free to ask lots of, lots of questions about everything. So if there are no initial questions, we'll go ahead and jump right in. So lecture review, merge sort. So finally, I get to use this image I look forward to. So this is the IKEA idea, little image that represents merge sort. So we have an unsorted array, and then it becomes sorted. And if you know what the IKEA instructions typically look like, this is a very IKEA representation. So I'm calling it the IKEA sort. But so when it comes down to the merge sort, there are two parts to it: uh, the merge and the actual merge sort. And merge sort kind of gets to take credit for everything, even though merge is doing most of the work. But merge sort just keeps splitting the array until we reach a base case of a guaranteed sorted array. So an array of size 0 or an array of size 1 is sorted by default. And then merge, so we actually get to combine two sorted arrays together to create a bigger, bigger sorted array. So this is um, not too bad, because since we know that the two subarrays are already sorted, we just throw them together, and then we just have a bigger sorted array. Questions on the overview? Cool. So this is kind of the pseudo -code um algorithm, what it looks like for the merge sort. So if array length is less than 1, we go ahead and return. Else, we split the array into left and right sides. We call merge sort on the left and right sides. And once we come back, we merge the left and the right. So the best case, worst case, and average case of this is just n log n. So we do the same big O amount of work regardless on how it's sorted, because each and every time we're splitting it further and further down, and then we're building it back up. And the reason why the best, worst, and average case, so this kind of took a while for me to get used to for seeing like n log n for the first time. So it kind of works like this. Um, we C stands for a constant amount of work each time, n is length of the array. So merge cost of n each time, because we're merging two arrays of half n to uh, become a full n. So it'll take nine iterations, or n iterations, in order to uh, merge the two subarrays together. And then we actually do this l times, where l is the number of levels our merge goes down to. So this ends up being log of n times. So as you can see, each time we split it. Um, so we have 2, 4, 8, all the way down to n times. So that's log of n times n time for the merge sort. So that's big O of n log n. Questions there? Questions on merge sort in general? 
I like Merge Sort. It's one of my favorites. It's not as good as Bogo Sort, but Merge Sort is pretty cool. Bogo Bogo. Heat death of the universe. So, if there are no questions there, I'll go ahead and move on to Quick Sort because I think it's a little bit of a bigger pain to try to figure out, but that's just me. But it's not too bad once you get the hang of it. So just like we saw with the merge sort, there are two parts to quick sort, but this time it's the partition and the actual quick sort. So quick sort, you find the partition and then you go ahead and call a quick sort on the left part of the partition and the right part of the partition. So the tricky part actually comes in when you're actually um, trying to find the partition. So we're gonna have a pivot value that we assign. So I believe in class C, we just assigned it to the beginning element of whatever array we were looking at. And at homework, the homework that you have, I believe you have to do at the end. So a little bit of tweaking here and there, but at the end of the day, we're still sorting. So it, as long as we're picking a good pivot, it doesn't much matter. If we pick a bad pivot, then it's n squared. So then it does kind of matter, but Basically what we want to do is uh, we keep wanting to move the partition to just b before where the pivot belongs in the final sorted array. So all things smaller than the pivot are going to be to the left of it and all things bigger than the pivot are going to be to the right. Questions on high level quick sort? All right, animation time. So there are at least two partition schemes I'm aware of, and we learned the Lomudo question mark on how that's pronounced partition scheme. So basically, what's happening is that we assign the pivot value and we'll just wait for it to start over, and then we compare. And if it's greater than, we go ahead and turn it green. Less than, we um, mark it yellow, and we'll want to make sure that we deal with making sure that the less than is on uh, the left side of the pivot and the greater is on the right side of the pivot. And then we ultimately move the pivot into its correct place and make sure that the partition, whenever we next, it, or next execute quick sort, uh, the partition is just to the left of the pivot. Pretty animation. And then helpful stuff there. I and J will help you keep track of the low and high values. Uh, questions there? Oh, cool. All right. And then there's also a different partition scheme where you're actually uh, swapping the low and the high. So I found a GIF for that as well. So there's more than one way to do the partition. And I personally like this one better. But either way, it gets the job done. So best case scenario and log in, we partition evenly. So it looks kind of like the merge sort, uh, the merge sort tree that I showed you a couple slides back. Worst case is n squared or n times n. So if we're picking horrible pivots, so if pivots at the beginning and our list is in uh, reverse sorted order, our tree begins to start looking like a linked list because we're only breaking off one element as we go um, down along. And then average case is big O of n log n because we partition evenly-ish. Questions there? Cool on quick start. So I think it's worth, I went over this briefly, I don't think to the entire class once of what's going on, but I think this might help with recursion. I thought it was a really good suggestion. So I'm gonna go kind of briefly and high level over the Java call stack and what's kind of going on over there. 
So stack is just another data structure. Um, it's a last in, first out data structure. So just as how we have like a stack of books or a stack of plates, we typically remove from the top because if we remove from the bottom, everything's gonna fall over. But instead of books or plates, here it's a stack of methods. Cool on what a stack is, at least at a high level. So since we know already that main is the main entryway into the program, and once main finishes, we're done with the program, um, if main makes calls to other methods, main has to wait on those met other methods before main itself can finish. Otherwise, how will we know when we're actually done? So if other methods, so these methods would be the caller methods, make calls to other methods, the callees, those methods have to wait on the callees before um, continuing on. So in this, main calls method A, which we call method B, which calls method C. And once method C gets done, then we go back to B, then A, then main. Cool there? So this is kind of what it would look like uh, going back to the recursive calls that we've been making. So um, with factorial over here, if we were wanting to print out the factorial of five, uh, the system.printline would be um, calling factorial of five. So that gets thrown onto the call stack. And then factorial of five doesn't know what to do until uh, factorial four. So it calls factorial of four, three, two, one. Factorial of one, we hit our base case. So um, it's the last thing that gets um, added to the call stack and we actually have a result for it now. So it's the first one that gets popped off. And then um, factorial of two uses that result from factorial of one and then factorial of three uses it from factorial of two, so on and so forth until we work our way down and keep popping all these method calls off and finally get our result for factorial of five. Questions there? Cool on recursion? Cool. Stack Overflow, and not the website that saves lives. So um, if Java says there's no more room on the call stack, um, whenever we're trying to add a new method call, so a new stack frame, it'll throw a Stack Overflow error because we don't well, computers have not yet been invented to have infinite space. So you can kind of think of it as literally what's going to happen. You have like some sort of call, call stack over here where it kind of looks like a cup that you're filling with methods. And then once it, the cup overflows, then you have the stack overflowing. So if you wanted to return the highest of high fives, stacking the call stack to the very tip top and actually catching a stack overflow error, return five, then you're giving the, what I think would be the highest of high fives to friends. So what actually happens here is that, spoiler. So it just returns five, and it doesn't actually look too interesting because Java is able to execute things pretty quickly, but we're able to return five. But if we don't catch the stack overflow error, we're gonna get this nastiness where it's going to throw an exception and the stack trace is just going to be whatever called the previous one. So it's quite a long list if you can see down over here. Questions there? So in that case, is like the amount of calls that are made into the process, the stack from the virtual machine, like the, the 
Uh, this is all going to be in the Java virtual machine. So whatever uh, the virtual machine allocates, um, that's how everything's going, at least um, the way that we're running Java right now. But can't think of a, an example where that would change because Java virtual machine kind of dictates all. Supreme. Yes, Supreme Overlord JVM. Any other questions there? Cool. So actually reading a stack trace, so as you saw before, the, there were like 20,794 um, of the same line of at test five because it was being called so many times until we overflowed. But if we had something like with list and we had a method where we were just trying to get the star of the list and return its value and we just had a list of ints. So if we create a new list and um, it's still empty and we try to get start and we don't take care of the null case because since the list is empty, start is still null, we're gonna end up getting a null pointer exception. So this actually happens at the get start. So whenever we try to access um, a value from an object that wasn't initialized, then we're going to get a null pointer exception. And then this is going to be um, called from get start at 19. And then as we go down the stack trace um, to test.main, since that was the original caller and where our um, program actually began, so that would be the end of our stack trace. So uh, probably, um, hopefully uh, you're far enough in the MP where you've already dealt with a lot of the null pointers or maybe you're so talented that you didn't even encounter one when you were programming it, but uh, hopefully like this will be able to help. And then also if you're trying to figure out what's going wrong in your MP and um, you're trying to figure out which part of the cert went wrong, you can actually throw these all on different lines to see. Um, for instance, I commented out some stuff. So null pointer exception here. So you can see that was actually at line 685. So stream here, which would have been using the result from get all atoms. So get all atoms is a list that actually Intel or Android Studio is cool enough to let us know that it's never assigned. So that's a good indication that if we uh, never initialized it, then it's probably still going to be null, and that might be the reason why we're encountering a null pointer exception. And then most of these internal calls you don't have to deal with or even worry about. Questions there? Cool. So as we saw right there. And then a friendly little inheritance reminder. So um, hopefully you figured out how to resolve this as well. But if you're trying to declare something of type list, you're going to get yelled at that you can't do that because list is an interface. So you can't actually see the slide there. So you can't actually declare an instance of an interface, so interface is a contract, not an implementation. But the advantage to this is it allows some sort of guarantee for certain behaviors. So let's say later on we're trying to optimize our MP or change it up, and it turns out that adding to front, we're going to end up doing that a lot. So we'll want to switch it to a linked list to make it more optimal. Um, but we wouldn't want to lose all the behavior that we would expect from a list. So whenever we um, would want to switch from linked li uh, array list to linked list, if we are using the interface of lists, which um, both linked list and array list um, 
they both implement, then we can still make sure that we still get our list functionality even after we would want to switch. Meanwhile, um, array lists, so it extends abstract lists and implements lists and a bunch of other things that we don't care about right now. But this is the actual class that we'll want to use. So even though you saw in the beginning that um, things were of type list, but whenever you actually declare a new instance of it, you'll want to say it's array list. Cool there? Cool. So bonus content, reassembling a, str a string tree. So this came up last week. So I thought that um, this would be a cool thing to go over. So trying to reassemble a tree from the string representation. So as we saw before, um, we have the current value to string, and then we call it to string on the right and um, to string on the left. So this is what's known as pre-order, where you do something. Um, so in this case, you're getting the value of the string, and then visit one subtree and then the other. So this is right to left, uh, because we're visiting the right subtree first and then the left. So since this is a binary tree and not like a binary search tree or something that has ordering or rules, um, a quick refresher on add. So the initial add starts with the root and the value. And if um, the current node is null, we assign, um, that should say current is equal to new node. That's okay. Yeah. I should say current. But anyway, so we assign the new value and implement or increment the size. Otherwise, if right is null, um, we'll assign it to be the new value. Oh, wait, root is right, isn't it? No, I'll have to think about that. Anyways, or then um, if right is not null, then we see if left is null and then assign it to the left. Um, otherwise, uh, the implementation that I saw from the lecture slides was um, just using the random next Boolean to see if we should add to the right or the left, depending on whatever random says. And then we repeat the process. So since it's pre-order, we instantly knew, know the root. So if to string gives us one, two, eight, nine, five for the binary tree, if we're adding in each element, one, two, five, eight, nine, we instantly know the root since we visit first, then go right, then go left. And then just as we saw before with add, it tries to add the right child, then the left. So the second element must be the right child. And then in this case, we'll actually have to refer to the original ordering um, to see what the left child should be. Um, so the left child over here should be five, not eight, but eight is listed in the to string next. So we actually know that that's two's right sub, uh, right sub child because of how add works. Cool there? And it's a similar story um, when trying to figure out where nine goes. So again, we have to refer to the original ordering to see what the root's left child should be. So again, uh, when we're initially adding all of these elements, we have the root and then we try to add the right subtree and then left subtree. So, uh, One's left subtree should be, should be five, not nine, so we know that nine is two's child. And then finally, we get to add five because we encountered it. And then if you kind of noticed, um, it's kind of like circling around the tree and you mark on the right side which one um, you visited since we're visiting the right subtree and then the left. So it kind of makes this fun little pattern. And then if we didn't have the original ordering here, we could actually get a couple different um, 
binary trees out of this if we were just going off of the two string because with this, you can go one, two, and then visit the left subtree, and then right, and then left. And here, we just keep going right, nothing to go left, and then we go left on one, and then right. And then over here, we have the original tree that we constructed. But all of these, if you were to go around using the, um, just circling the tree, you would end up still with the pre-order representation. Questions there? Oops. Everything good? Life good? Well, you have plenty of time to work on MP5 due tomorrow, last I knew. So have a good break and stay warm. And now the rest of the time is yours.